Maybe you'll get diabetes mellitus. So what is diabetes mellitus? So diabetes means siphon and mellitus means sweet. So this is a syndrome characterized by hyperglycemia due to an absolute or relative lack of insulin and or insulin resistance. There are different types of diabetes. So there's type 1, type 2, gestational diabetes. And they have secondary causes such as pancreatic damage, endocrine damage, endocrine disease, hepatic cirrhosis, and for medication, steroids. So let's look at type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes affects 10% of diabetic patients, is the most common in young people, and the peak incidence for this is 9 to 14 years of age. It has a rapid onset and absolute lack of insulin. It's a reason it's occurs, resulting in autoimmune destruction of beta cells. There is meant to be an environmental trigger such as a viral infection which can cause type 1 diabetes. Look at type 2, so majority of diabetic patients are 90% type 2. This is occur at any age, usually greater than 40 years old. It's an increased problem in the developed world and it is commonly associated with obesity and results from a resistance to insulin action. So insulin levels may not be normal or even high, could probably be normal or even high, and eventually beta cell failure and insulin deficiency occurs. There are various risk factors of type 2 diabetes such as weight gain, obesity, lack of exercise, family history of diabetes, ethnicity, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, high cholesterol and low high density lipoprotein. Type 1 by diabetes occurs with insulin. Treatment of type 2 can occur with diet and exercise, oral hypoglycemic drugs and insulin and it's also controlling the blood pressure and the lipids. There are clinical features of diabetes such as polyuria, with an increased urine volume. First, so if the plasma glucose is greater than 10 millimolar per litre, then this can result in glycosuria, which is glucose in urine, then osmotidiuresis, and then polyuria. There's also weight loss, fatigue, and infections. So when diagnosing diabetes, you need to look for symptoms of the strong family history of diabetes and glycosuria, but, it's not, but that's not diagnostic alone, glycosuria. And you have to investigate the plasma glucose, the fasting glucose, the random glucose levels, and the oral glucose tolerance test. The diagnostic criteria is that normal fasting venous plasma glucose should be less than 6.1 millimolar per litre. So there's diabetes symptoms for diagnosis such as polyuria, polydipsia, and unexplained weight loss, as well as fasting venous plasma glucose greater or equal than 7.0. A random plasma glucose test greater than 11.1 or equal to a two hour plasma glucose greater or equal to 11.1 conducted in the oral, oral glucose tolerance test. So, if there are no symptoms, you cannot make a diagnosis of a single glucose measurement. Raised glucose concentration diametric range must be demonstrated on another day. The previous slide about the oral glucose tolerance test so the patient must be fasting, resting, and no smoking. So a fasting venous plasma sample is taken at zero minutes. 75 glucose in 300 milliliter water is taken orally over five minutes. Then a second plasma sample is taken two hours after ingestion of the glucose. And the interpretation is here in this table below. So if it's normal, it's less than 6.1 and less than 7.8. And then for diabetes mellitus, it's greater than or equal to 7.0 or greater than or equal to 11.1. So I mentioned here in the previous slide about, you've seen a table about IFG and IGT. So this is what's known as pre-diabetes, so impaired fasting glycemia and impaired glucose tolerance. So this is people who have a risk of developing di diabetes in the future. Increased risk of vascular complications. So they wonder do an annual oral glucose tolerance test and they also have diet and lifestyle advice. So it's important to note from diabetes, you also have metabolic complications such as acute hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia and you also, also have chronic metabolic complications which involve long-term effects of chronic hypoglycemia. So looking at the acute metabolic complications so you have causes of coma in a diabetic patient which is hypoglycemia, diabetes, ketoacidosis and hyposmolar non-ketotic hypoglycemia. So looking at hypoglycemia first, the most common cause of coma in diabetics, the plasma glucose is less than 2.5. This happens by the result of over-administration of insulin or other drugs used in treatment of diabetes. So too high a dose, missed meal, excess of exercise. Then you have signs and symptoms such as sweating, anxiety, tremor, confusion, dizziness, hunger. 
with diabetes ketoacidosis. This is more predominant in type 1 diabetes, so all metabolic disturbances in diabetes ketoacidosis are consequences of a lack of insulin. So this is precipitated by omission of insulin, infection, heart attack and trauma. So in diabetes, ketoacidosis, you have hypoglycemia, glycosuria, ketonuria, metabolic acidosis, you also have dehydration, shock, vomiting, hyperventilation, and you also have what's called ketone breath, so you have pear drop smell coming from your breath. Looking at the third cause of coma, which is hyperosmolar non ketotic hypoglycemia, so this occurs in type 2 diabetes, which is more common in the elderly. It develops over, over days or weeks. There is no ketosis, minimal acidosis. It is precipitated by severe illness, dehydration, glucocorticoids or surgery. Glucose is usually greater than 50 millimolar. There is severe dehydration and a risk of thrombosis. Thrombosis and blood clots. So treating DKA and HONK, hyposmolic thingy. Insulin, so a lower dose required in your HONK. Fluid replacement, you have intravenous saline. Potassium replacement, and you have heparin and anticoagulant. That's looking at the acute complications, right? So these are now moving on to the metabolic complications of chronic. So you have chronic hypoglycemia, which can cause long term damage in blood vessels, nerves, and organs. Previously, you have a diagnosis of diabetes, but the better chances, if you have earlier diagnosed with diabetes, you get the better the chances of minimizing complications. These come in two types macrovascular and microvascular. So macrovascular large vessel disease and microvascular is damage to small blood vessels. So in macrovascular complications, you have cardiovascular disease, which is premature, coronary heart disease, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, which is related to high blood pressure, high cholesterol and smoking. And the major cause of death in diabetic patients is CHD, so coronary heart disease. For your microvascular complications, you have retinopathies, nephropathy, and neuropathy. So these are closely related to the long-term control of blood glucose, glycemic control. So for diabetic retinopathy, you have damage to the blood vessels in the retina, and this may lead to blindness. And it's 25 times more common in diabetes, met met uh, diabetes mellitus. For diabetic nephropathy, you have loss of small amounts of protein in the urine in a process known as microalbuminia, right, where you have 300, 30 to 300 milligrams a day. This progresses to overt protein urea, which is greater than 300 milligrams per day, and deterioration of kidney function. So this ultimately leads to renal failure, and this is 70 times more common in diabetes. You also end up needing a renal dialysis. For diabetic neuropathy, this happens due to damage of nerve blood vessels, abnormal glucose metabolism in nerve cells. This is also what's known as diabetic foot, so numbness, damage, ulcer, infection, gas gangrene, and an amputation. You can see in the picture below gangrene. So I'll touch upon gangrene in one of my videos uh, relating to microbiology that I'll upload soon, hopefully, once I've got the topic sorted. But I do plan to touch upon that. So monitoring diabetes, you can have a process known as point of home care test, point of care home testing in which you measure the blood glucose testing. Once again, there'll be a video specifically made on point of care testing as well. You can see here, you might have seen these machines in your house actually, or your family or friends, etc. If anyone has got diabetes, you'll see. So these are machines that can measure your glucose level and they're portable as well, etc. Many benefits of point of care testing, but as I said, I'll touch, on, touch upon it in another video. And finally, looking at uh, glycated hemoglobin, HbA1c. This is formed by non-enzymatic glycation of hemoglobin. It is dependent on mean plasma glucose concentration and lifespan of red blood cells. Retrospective assessment of the mean plasma glucose concentration over the previous 68 weeks is expressed as a millimolar per mole of total hemoglobin. So these are the values below if you get if you get it measured. Non-diabetic 20 41 millimolar per mole and, and for diabetic patients it's 48 59 millimolar per mole. We touched upon that briefly about like the hemoglobin. This is one of the tests I've done in a laboratory as well, straight away for diabetes as well as your glucose levels to measure your sugars. And it is used, as I just mentioned, just there, it is used in combination with plasma glucose. It does not detect hypoglycemic episodes. You can get falsely low values if the red blood cell lifespan is shortened, so you have hemolytic anemia. 
and this correlates with the risk of microvascular complications and tight glycemic control can delay the onset of diabetic complications. So that's the end of our video today for diabetes mellitus. Um, there will be another video on diabetes more coming more, which looks into more about the pathology and the uh, mechanisms that sit are about type one and type two. So this was just an overview of diabetes, to be honest, and how it's diagnosed in a lab. But there will be that as well about the physiological basis. Anyway, thanks so much for listening to my video. Hope you had fun today. Thank you. Bye bye.